Good evening. Does this work in here? Yes. Thank you for coming tonight. Uh, my name is Philip Munoz. I'm the Tocqueville Associate Professor of Political Science. I have a position in the uh, law school as well, um, but uh, more importantly, my role tonight is director of the Tocqueville program uh, for inquiry into religion and public life, and also the constitutional studies minor. Uh, for any students who might be interested in either program, especially we have a fellowship program of um, about eight, eight or nine fellows every year uh, who help us plan events like, like this one itself. Uh, or you might be interested in the minor, please come talk to me uh, after, after the event. Uh, it's really a pleasure on behalf of the, the fellows, uh, the dean's fellows of the College of uh, Liberal Arts, uh, of Arts and Letters, and Bridge and Dee uh, to welcome you to our debate tonight after Obergefell, The Future of Marriage, Gay Rights, and Religious Freedom. Uh, we host uh, a number of events uh, every year uh, at the Tokyo program and Constitutional Studies program. Uh, and all of our programs help us to uh, aim to help us understand and think more deeply about our fundamental principles of political liberty, about human freedom, and about constitutional government. Uh, recently, we've had archbishops here on campus, senators, Supreme Court justices, uh, but I really believe that tonight's event is our most important and consequential event to date. Um, we're here to gather, uh, we gather here to discuss issues of immense importance, issues that are deeply personal, issues that deeply divide our country. What is marriage? What is equality? What does equality demand? Uh, can we recognize gay rights and the rights of religious freedom? And our event tonight is not only of fundamental importance because of the subjects we cover, but how we intend to, to cover them, by the, the manner by which we are approaching them. Uh, for a free and diverse people to live together well uh, in a system of self-government, we need to be able to talk together, to deliberate together, uh, and most importantly, to listen to those with whom we disagree. Uh, it's easy to demonize, it's easy to reject, it's easy to cast aside, it's much harder to hear, to listen, to consider, and to engage, especially on matters that are deeply important to us. But if we can engage views with which we disagree in an open, a respectful, and even in a charitable, charitable manner, uh, we can't live together as a people in one community. Uh, and this is especially true of a university community, the very purpose of which is to try to discover, to pursue, and ultimately live in harmony with the truth. Essential to our pursuit at Notre Dame is openness and receptivity to the truth, wherever it might be found and from wh whomever we might learn. And that openness requires that we listen and talk to those with views different than our own. We are blessed tonight to have two extraordinarily accomplished and thoughtful gentlemen with us. We asked uh, Dr. Anderson and Macedo, Dr. Macedo to participate in this debate tonight because they embody the ideal of scholarly excellence. Uh, they each offer powerful arguments for their positions, and their arguments are powerful because they forcefully, but also charitably, and with goodwill, uh, engage those alternative views that they disagree with. Uh, I'm gonna have one of our uh, students uh, give more formal introductions to our speakers. Uh, but I, uh, but Steve and Ryan, I want you to uh, know how much I appreciate you coming, how much I respect uh, your work, and how what, it's a privilege and an honor to call you my friend. Um, let me recognize two uh, members of my team. Uh, Jennifer Smith, uh, who's not with us tonight, she just had a baby. Uh, she runs the program, basically, as you all know. And, uh, <laughs> and Becca Devine, um, none of this is possible without them, so thank you. Now we're going to do a Lincoln-Douglas uh, format. Uh, Professor Macedo is going to speak first for uh, 20 minutes. We'll give him an extra minute or two, but just two, if he goes over. Uh, and then Professor Anderson will uh, speak for about 25 minutes, and then we'll let uh, Dr. Macedo speak for another five minutes or so. We should have uh, plenty of time for uh, questions uh, uh, from the audience. Uh, to explain the technology we're going to use uh, to help us with the Q&A session, uh, I want to bring uh, to the podium first uh, Roger Karma, uh, who's a student in one of my classes and also the president of Bridge and D. And then uh, we'll have uh, Seamus Ronan come and he'll introduce our speaker. So thank you very much for uh, joining us tonight, Roger. Thank you, Professor Munoz. Uh, I, I have a very loud voice. 
Um, so I'm here to kind of tell you how you can get involved on the conversation tonight and also to explain a little about Bridge NV, which is basically a club that wants to bring these kind of conversations that we're having tonight and get students involved in them. So we're a bipartisan student organization here on campus that tries to bring students from across the political spectrum together in debates over public policy issues of national importance. So the very kind of debate we're having tonight, if you want to go beyond like watching these great thinkers speak and actually join the conversation for yourself, Bridge is the place to do that uh, here on campus, and that's the kind of uh, campus dialogue we're trying to promote. Um, and so we are actually having a meeting right after this in this very room on education reform. We meet Tuesdays at 8 p.m. at McNeil, and our email's up there if you want to learn more. Um, and I know you don't want me to hear, uh, hear me ramble on about Bridge, uh, so now I'm going to talk about how you can get involved in the conversation tonight. So as you can see on these screens up here, um, we have a system so that as the speakers are talking tonight, you can actually text in questions uh, as you think of them. Uh, we, you can text the phrase, so you're going to text the number 284584 and your question to that number. So you're, uh, and, or you can go online if you don't have texting. And then we ask you, they can be anonymous or not. Uh, if you want, you can include your name, year, area of study so we can recognize you. But it is important to know exactly who you're addressing your question to, whether it's both speakers, one speaker, etc. Um, and so that's how you can get involved in the conversation. Um, should be a really lively debate. Feel free to check out Bridge ND uh, if you get a chance and want to get involved in the debate yourself. And without further ado, we're going to bring up a senior, uh, Seamus Ronan, who's in the, a TOEFL fellow in the TOEFL program, and my personal hero, who is going to introduce our speakers. Thank you. Thank you, Jose. I also have a loud voice, but I'm going to be louder than you. So. Good evening, everyone. Uh, as Roger said, my name is Seamus, and I am a Dean's and Tocqueville Fellow, and I have the tremendous privilege of introducing our two speakers for tonight's debate. Uh, first, I'd like to thank Dean Joseph Stanfield, leader of the uh, Dean's Fellows, and Professor Munoz for helping organize this debate, uh, which also happens to be the title of my senior thesis. Uh, essentially, this debate is really just helping me, um, but I appreciate all of you for attending as well. <laughs> our first speaker is Professor Stephen Macedo. I was first introduced to Professor Macedo's work in Sot Barber's class last spring, Gay Rights and the Constitution, where I read excerpts from Professor Macedo's most recent book, Just Married, Same-Sex Couples, Monogamy, and the Future of Marriage, Princeton University Press. In it, he defends same-sex marriage, marriage as a civil institution, and monogamy from the standpoint of justice and the human good. He's currently the Lawrence S. Rockefeller Professor of Politics at Princeton, the former director of the University Center of Human Values at Princeton, and the founding director of Princeton's program in law and public affairs. He writes and teaches extensively on political theory, ethics, public policy, and law, and especially on topics related to liberalism, democracy, citizenship, diversity, religion and politics, and the family and sexuality. Our second speaker has become one of the more prominent conservative media spokespersons after a particularly interesting exchange on Piers Morgan Live and a front page profile by the Washington Post. Ryan T. Anderson is the William E. Simon Senior Research Fellow in American Principles and Public Policy at the Heritage Foundation. Anderson earned his PhD in political philosophy from Notre Dame while co-authoring What is Marriage? Man and Woman, a Defense with Princeton's Robert P. George and Sharif Gerges. His book, Truth Overruled, The Future of Marriage and Religious Freedom, was the first book-length response to the Supreme Court's 2015 ruling on marriage. He's also the founder and editor of Public Discourse, the online journal of the Witherspoon Institute, and is currently under contract with Oxford University Press, writing a book with John Corvino and Sharif Gerges on religious liberty. He also has been recently mistaken because of his beard for Leonardo DiCaprio from The Revenant. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> Professor Stephen Macedo and Ryan T. Anderson. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Um, uh, it's very nice to be here at Notre Dame, and I've enjoyed my conversations very much and look forward to the discussion. Thanks to Philip and the organizers and my former teacher, Scott Barber, uh, for, uh, for facilitating this. And I'm delighted to have the chance to appear again with Ryan. So public opinion on gay rights generally and same-sex marriage have shifted astonishingly uh, over the last 15 years, and even more so over the last 20 or 30 years. Americans in their 50, 50s and older, there are a few of us here, uh, didn't know any openly gay people when they were young, very likely, I certainly didn't. But as Americans came out of the closet, partly in response to the AIDS epidemic, 
and Americans began to come to grips with the idea that homosexuality is not a lifestyle choice, uh, but rather a settled and deep-seated feature of one's personality. I mean, the question arose, how do you expect people to live? Uh, what do you expect them to do? And uh, shouldn't we accord them equal rights? The shift has been astonishingly fast. 20 years ago, barely a quarter of Americans supported gay marriage, but today's level of support is approaching two-thirds. And among young Americans, 18 to 30 years old, 80% support it. Uh, having first written on this issue about 30 years ago, I'm, I'm quite astonished. And so we've had an argument over gay rights that has raged in this country for 30 years since, since Bowers versus Hardwick when the Supreme Court upheld criminal prohibitions on uh, same-sex relationships. And, and a notable aspect of that has been, I think, a collective commitment to try to face these issues on the basis of public reasons and evidence on both sides. And I've been delighted to participate in a number of these sorts of discussions over the years with uh, John Finnis here at, uh, at uh, Notre Dame, uh, Rodney George, my colleague at, at Princeton, and more recently, uh, folks like, like Ryan and his co-author, Sharif. So I'm, I'm delighted to have the opportunity. Um, the issue, uh, I think, as Justice Kennedy put it, Lawrence versus Texas, is whether uh, the majority or now the minority may use the power of the state to enforce its own ideal sexual ethic on the whole society. And what we're talking here to debate, of course, and discuss is civil marriage in American law. Uh, not the sacrament of marriage or, the, or religious marriage. These things are obviously quite distinct. And I want to defend, in effect, what I think of as the common sense emergent understanding of marriage uh, in America today. Uh, I take its core to be, and I, not just marriage as a civil institution, but also monogamy, which I think, uh, I think same-sex marriage, marriage, and monogamy go along together very well for reasons I'll describe. Uh, and the common sense uh, view of marriage that I think is dominant in America today. Uh, I don't defend every issue, every aspect of the practice, but I take the core to be a public declaration of two people who commit in public to loving and caring for one another over a lifetime and to build a life in common together. This is the core of the marriage vows, to have and to hold from this day forward for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and health till death do us part. Notwithstanding a divorce rate that hovers over, a bit over 40%, Marriage is still a presumptively permanent commitment to build a life, to stick together through all of life's trials, and to work at making the marriage work, to work at making the commitment of marriage work. Deciding to marry and, and deciding who to marry uh, are among the most consequential decisions any of us can make. And I think as people look back on their lives, if they've had reasonably successful marriages, they regard it as one of the great central good aspects of their lives. And I think that's something that Americans share. Uh, now, uh, and I think this is the vast majority of Americans. I mean, there's some views that say marriage is increasingly passe. And indeed, among young people, uh, uh, there's some skepticism about marriage. I, I think there are various reasons for that. But the fact is that the vast majority of American adults are either married or would like to be. Now, Ryan and his co-authors tend to describe the revisionist account of marriage that has come to dominate our culture and that accommodates same-sex marriage quite easily, and I think we talked about this a little bit at dinner, or Ryan was talking about it with thought, as a purely emotional bond. But I don't think that's true. The vast majority of American heterosexual couples fall in love, have sexual relations, and cohabit before marrying. So the emotional bond is there. The emotional bond is there without the marriage. Marriage is a solemnized public commitment surrounded by immense cultural and religious resonance to settle down with another person. It perhaps is built around an emotional bond, but it is not the emotional bond, it seems to me. It's the commitment of two people to build a life in common together. The public meaning of marriage, the cultural resonance that it has, that marrying couples want access to, is a vital part of what's at stake. A number of times in the course of the debate about same-sex marriage in California, New Jersey, and Massachusetts, Judges pose the question, well, look, same-sex couples have domestic partnerships or civil unions available to them, which have all the same terms as marriage under state law. You were, why are we just having all this litigation about the word marriage, people would say. And over and over again, litigants came back and said, that's crucial to what's at stake. What people want to be able to do is enter into the marital commitment, as we understand it in our society, uh, and to have it be known as a matter of common knowledge that they're married. The public me meaning of marriage is a vital part of what's at stake. That public meaning allows two people to settle down, enter into a widely understood form of commitment to one another in public. 
John, and this is something I think that's in some respects common ground between right and left on this issue and, and positions in between. John Finnis has emphasized, and I quote, the fundamental simplicity and intelligibility of marriage as a legal framework. And Andrew Sullivan, decades ago, defended the benefits of, and I quote, a clear common symbol of commitment. No other status has the same meaning in our society. Domestic partnerships, civil unions, uh, and other options have unclear meanings and implications. None of them mean what marriage means, the commitment to build a life together in common. The public meaning that marriage brings has a host of entailments and implications that people generally understand. A spouse is the other spouse's <coughs> surrogate decision making in, in the event of incapacitation. Hospital visitation rights, powers of attorney uh, uh, can be trusted to make decisions uh, if, someone is, uh, if someone is incapacitated. Uh, we all recognize and have a sense of what these implications are. And likewise, marriage is surrounded by social norms. Adultery is highly disapproved of in our society. In fact, over the course of time that same-sex marriage has been increasingly approved of, adultery has risen in public disapproval, not decline. Uh, well over 80% say it's always wrong. So there are social norms that surround marriage, expectations that couples enter into that help to solidify their commitment to solidify their relationship with it and support the relationship, the commitment that people make to each other. And people want to enter into those commitments and have it known uh, uh, that they're making that commitment to one another. As long as they do so freely, those constraints, as it were, are freedom enabling because it's a valuable option to undertake this commitment. So what does the law of marriage uh, do for us? Well, people want to get married not just as a matter of private desire, not just as a matter of private commitment to another person, but in the eyes of the whole society. They want it to be recognized that they've entered into this public commitment. And the law of marriage facilitates the realization of people's serious desire to get married and to, to be known to be married as a matter of common knowledge before everyone in their society. Not just to your family, not just to your friends, not just to other members of your church community, but to everybody in society. You wear a ring, it's very public. It's both personal and extremely public to enter into this form of commitment. And the law of marriage makes that, the way I put it in the book, is kind of socially legible. It makes the meaning of this marital commitment understood in the society as a whole. And it was put very well by Kristen Perry, one of the lead plaintiffs in California Proposition 8 litigation. She said that marriage provided access to a language to describe her relationship with her partner. And as she said, I'm a 45-year-old woman I've been in love with a woman for 10 years, and I don't have a word to tell anyone about that. This is in the course of the litigation. Marriage would be a way to tell our friends, our family, our society, our community, our parents, and each other that this is a lifetime commitment. We're not girlfriends, we're not partners, we're married. So marriage as commitment, I think that's the core of it. And I think that's what the core of it is in our law. And I think it's what same-sex couples want equal access to. So was the majority decision in Obergefell required by the Constitution's principles of liberty, equality, and justice? Well, it seems to me clearly yes. The Supreme Court has repeatedly described marriage as a basic institution of society, as an extended the right to marry to convicted felons, deadbeat dads, and so on. It certainly ought to be extended to same-sex couples. As Justice Kennedy put it, the intimate and committed relationship of same-sex couples, just like those of heterosexual couples, provide mutual support and are the foundation of family life in our society. No union is more profound than marriage, for it embodies the highest ideals of love, fidelity, devotion, sacrifice, and family. In forming a marital union, two people become something greater than they once were. That seems, seems to me that he's right. And in fact, it's not at all hard to find pro-marriage liberals <coughs> who take very much this view. Ronald Dworkin, who is one of the best known liberal legal philosophers of the last 50 or 60 years, who just passed away last year, a constant writer for the New Yorker Review, Review of Books and uh, a champion of liberal causes, often associated with a kind of idea of state ethical neutrality, said this about marriage. It's an utterly unique association, a distinct mode of association and commitment that carries centuries and volumes of social and personal meaning. He continued it, and I quote, we can no more create an alternative mode of commitment carrying a parallel intensity of meaning than we can create a substitute for poetry or love. The status of marriage is therefore a social resource of irreplaceable value to those to whom it is offered. It enables people together to create value in their lives that they could not create if that institution never existed. 
So Justice Kennedy's reasoning in Obergefell has been criticized, but it seems to me the core of his decision is the moral insight, recognizing a fundamental right, that the state can only justly exclude gay couples from marrying if, if it can provide substantial reasons and evidence, and that, it seems to me, the states manifestly failed to do. The same benefits of marriage to heterosexual couples are also available to homosexual couples. Numerous studies show that people in reasonably happy marriages have better physical and psychological health, lower mortality rates, increased longevity compared to single people, and this is especially true for men. Women basically do pretty well without marriage, but men do not. Uh, <laughs> men need marriage more than women do, it appears. <laughs> Uh, uh, and uh, this is, uh, but, but, uh, uh, but happy marriages are something that benefits everybody. Uh, and uh, certainly uh, there's ample evidence that uh, same-sex couples benefit enormously from lower levels of psychological stress and social stigma that is associated with being given access to the institution of marriage. That is also certainly true for their children. 200,000 plus children in this country are being raised by same-sex couples and Justice Kennedy quite took very seriously the interest of children and focused on, among other things, the interest of those 200,000 children being raised by same-sex parents. And also, of course, the millions of children out there who are gay or lesbian uh, and young adults uh, whose suicide rates even now are double that of their straight peers. But how will marriage, how will same-sex marriage affect marriage for everybody else, for, for everybody? Well, it might help to reverse its decline since the Windsor and Obergefell decisions, same-sex couples have been marrying at a very high rate. In 2013, not that long ago, only 21% of same-sex couples were married. And that is now more than double to 45%. Over half a million couples or a million gay and lesbian Americans are now married. There were 100,000 gay marriages in just the four months after Obergefell. So that's a, a, a big resurgence in marriage. And yet we have some serious disagreements that we want to focus on. And I, I, I used Ryan's co-authored book in class, and I, I admire its clarity and its moral and intellectual seriousness, but I do, I do disagree with it. So I think many of you are familiar with the, the, the general argument, and that is, and its core, I think, is that sexual intercourse between a man and a woman is the sine qua non of marriage, uh, even if, owing to the sterility of one or both of the partners, actual procreation is impossible. So Ryan and his co-authors, Sharif Jurgis and Robbie George, say that marriage is necessarily formed by only a man and a woman because marriage is a union whose norms and obligations are decisively shaped by its essential dynamism towards children. And crucially, that dynamism comes not from the actual or expected presence of children, which some same-sex partners and even cohabiting brothers could have, and some opposite-sex couples lack, but from the way that marriage is sealed or consummated in coitus, or intercourse, which is organic bodily union. Now, it's on this basis that uh, Ryan and his co-authors insist that same-sex couples are not denied a right to marriage. They're rather ineligible for marriage by nature. Same-sex marriage is a moral impossibility on this view because same-sex couples cannot mate. No coitus, no marriage. Uh, the authors say that this is a luminous truth and a universal moral reality, that marriage is a two-in-one flesh communion. In other words, according to this argument, I think they're having a discussion about this at dinner, it's the baby making sex, not the babies, that make sense of marital norms of two-ness or monogamy, permanence, and exclusivity. Now, in my experience, this argument either has a grip on you or it doesn't. And if it doesn't, it's very hard to make sense of its significance, I think. Uh, and this is true for many Catholic theologians and philosophers, who I'll quote uh, in, in a minute. Uh, the arguments advanced for this position seem to many people arbitrarily narrow and hard to comprehend. Jurisdiction Anderson and George advance a startling claim, for example, that, and I quote, marriage is possible between only two because no act can organically unite three or more and thus seal a comprehensive union of three or more lives. In other words, marriage is possible between only two pr pr people because only two people can have intercourse at the same time. I, polygamy has existed in 85% of societies across human history, and I don't think any of the defenders of polygamy would be moved by that observation. It seems to me that polygamy doesn't make sense as a social institution under conditions of equality because you lack, in a polygamous union, the, the reciprocity of a monogamous union of equals between husband and wife. 
There is no society in the world in which women are equal, in which polygamy flourishes. And there's no society in the world in which women are equal, which is any broad social movement in favor of polygamy. Uh, monogamy and the equality of women go together very, very strongly. And it's because monogamy makes sense as an equal relationship of two co-equal spouses who make a commitment, a reciprocal and equal commitment to one another. So the, the two-ness of marriage makes sense because of the way that human beings are constituted, heterosexual or, or uh, homosexual, to make this kind of comprehensive commitment to one another in a marital relationship. The, the fact that, that intercourse is also a two-person act uh, 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 when it's considered as a discrete act seems to me at best tangential uh, uh, and, uh, and, and, uh, and not the essence of the matter at all. Um, and I think in order to make sense of the two-ness of marriage, uh, Germain Grise and others have relied on the same sorts of arguments that I've relied upon about the preconditions of a, of a two-person reciprocal marriage. Uh, and the history of polygamy displays its strong proneness to violence uh, and inequality. Now, as Chief Justice Marshall of the Massachusetts Supreme Court observed, the marriage as procreation argument that's being talked here does single out the one unbridgeable difference between same-sex and opposite-sex couples and transforms that difference into the essence of legal marriage. In so doing, the state's action confers an official stamp of disapproval, this is quote quoting Marshall, on the destructive stereotype that same-sex relations are inherently unstable and inferior to, to opposite-sex relations and less worthy of respect. So children, spouses, and society benefit as I've already reserved from stable, healthy marriages, but it seems bizarre to say that coitus with no possibility, with no babies, no possibilities of pa babies, requires permanent and exclusive commitment. I don't see what it is about the baby making sex rather than the babies that makes uh, the uh, relationship of marriage uh, 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 one that's oriented towards permanence. It's building a life in common together that orients it towards permanence. There is as well the argument for the double standard. How much time do I have left? Four. Two minutes, okay. For infertile couples, which I won't go into, it's, uh, 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 but so we can talk more about that. Now this argument is not featured prominently in the federal court decisions leading up to the Obergefell decision because I think it doesn't resonate widely uh, with the public. The channeling argument for marriage did resonate widely, but that's a very different argument that we might talk about if there's time. Now, the other thing about the, the, the argument of the book that I think is problematic is this. They never actually talk about actual gay and lesbian couples. They deal with the phenomenon of same-sex relationships in terms of strange hypotheticals, uh, saying, for example, at one point uh, that there's no resemblance between gay and lesbian couples and married couples. They dismissively remark at one point, just deciding to rear children together is not enough to make you marry. Three monks who commit to caring for an orphan do not thereby marry. Well, why say such a thing, hypotheticals about three monks, rather than talk about actual gay and lesbian couples marrying children? Why not talk about uh, Lois Farnham and Holly Putterbaugh, the, the litigants in the Vermont Civil Unions case in 1999, who at the time had been living together for 30 years, leaders in their church, active in their community groups, tax-paying citizens of the state of Vermont, caretakers over the years of 15 foster children and one adopted child, and they wanted to marry to help to support that family and to support their long-term committed relationship. Why not talk about them rather than three monks wanting to raise a child or college roommates wanting to raise a child as, uh, as a stand-in for these uh, 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 same-sex couples? Uh, or Sandy Steyer, who was married to Chris Perry, who said, we have a loving, committed relationship. We're not business partners. We're not glorified roommates. We want to be married. It's a different relationship. Uh, and that's the kind of relationship we want to enter. So uh, the uh, characterization of uh, the good of marriage that's offered by Ryan and Scalartha seems to me to be artificially narrow uh, by insisting that uh, intercourse is a precondition of marriage. The same observation has been made by various professors. Stephen Pope at Boston College says that the new natural law fails to build a logical case for the claim that all homosexual acts are reducible to the pursuit of individual self-gratification. He charges professor at Boston College, the natural law proponents, with gross overgeneralization, insisting that gay people are more diverse and in morally relevant ways than the new natural law allows. Paul Weichmann here at, uh, at uh, Notre Dame in the philosophy department has made the same kind of argument. Uh, and finally, I will quote Paul Griffiths, a Catholic theologian at Duke University, who said this about the new natural law arguments. And I think it's very important. I think the orthodoxy is true, that is the Catholic orthodoxy. I think the arguments are valid. 
and I'm quoting, and it would be better if anybody thought so, but there are not, as a matter of fact, <laughs> arguments available that do or should convince those who do not hold the orthodox view, whether Catholics or non-Catholics, that they should. The lack of such arguments, I'll call them public arguments, is empirically obvious. The premises are rationally disputable. The truth about none of these things is obvious or self-evident, which is among the reasons that thoughtful, well-meaning people differ so profoundly about them. I think the question is whether it's appropriate in a diverse society, a religiously diverse society, to make one particular ideal of marriage, and I think it's a very respectable ideal of marriage, the basis for the law of marriage that applies to everyone in this, in, in this religiously diverse society. Griffiths says no, it would not be appropriate, and he argues that Catholics as citizens should be free to support same-sex marriage as a matter of civil law. That displays, it seems to me, not only political but moral sense, uh, and I, I think that uh, 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 it's a basis for uh, going forward. So I've gone about 20 minutes, and I'll cease at this point. Is that Thank you. Great. Well, um, thank you. Uh, thank you for being here tonight. And, um, thank you for Professor Munoz for organizing this. Uh, and thank you for Professor Mestito for um, those introductory comments. Um, Professor Mestito and I uh, did a debate similar to this a couple months ago at Eastern University, and I was a student as an undergraduate at Princeton, but I was never fortunate enough uh, to take any courses with Professor Mestito. And now, the more and more I interact with him, the more and more I regret uh, that decision not to study with him. I was, uh, unfortunately, a music major as an undergraduate, <laughs> and the first political science course I took was as a graduate student here at Notre Dame. Um, I want to start, um, as any good conservative should, by turning back the clock uh, 50 years. <laughs> <laughs> That's a joke, I'm glad you took up that. Um, <laughs> uh, 50 years to the Moynihan Report. I want to start with uh, Daniel Patrick Moynihan's report. Um, Moynihan wrote 50 years ago, ringing the alarm bell, that births to single mothers within the African American community were 25%, while in the general American population, they were in the single digits. And Moynihan said, something is going wrong with the American family that a quarter of all uh, black children are being born to single moms. Moynihan was then quickly accused of being a racist, uh, even though he's a liberal senator from the state of New York and he was a liberal sociology professor from Harvard. He wrote this report precisely because he wasn't a racist. And he cared about black children. And he cared that something was going on within the family structure that was going to spell trouble for those children for those mothers, and for those communities at large. Uh, what Moynihan was pointing out, uh, I think now we can see in hindsight, was that a new understanding of what marriage is and of what uh, the norms of human sexual relations are was starting to spread uh, throughout America, first within the African American community and then within the broader American community. This was the early onset of the sexual revolution, an early onset of an understanding of marriage and human sexuality <coughs> which says that consenting adults should do whatever consenting adults want to do. Uh, that there is no right or wrong or better or worse when it comes to autonomous consensual adult activity vis-a-vis -vis human sexuality. Um, if you fast forward to today, we now know that 40% of all Americans are born to single mothers. It's 50% of Hispanics and it's over 72% of African American children. Uh, these children have done nothing wrong, obviously. Uh, frequently, these mothers have done nothing wrong. But something has gone wrong, uh, so that more than half of American children in the two largest minority communities in the states are being born outside of marriage. And the consequences in terms of social mobility and poverty and employment and graduation rates and incarceration rates and crime statistics are rather tragic. My argument here, obviously, is that gays and lesbians are not to blame for this. Uh, gays and lesbians are not to blame for the breakdown of the American family. They're not to blame for the increase of non-marital childbearing. They're not the ones uh, creating children outside of marriage. I do want to suggest that the vision of marriage and human sexuality that is to blame, a liberal ideology uh, that comes to kind of uh, prominence during the late 60s and the sexual revolution, is the vision of marriage that has fueled Justice Kennedy's majority opinion for the Supreme Court, the five to four ruling on Obergefell. It's the vision of marriage that has largely uh, fueled the public discourse for the past decade. 
And now that it's enshrined into law, it will further deteriorate marriage in the United States. After all, the phrase is marriage should last as long as the love lasts. And love makes a family are not slogans that gays and lesbians created. Those are slogans that straight people created in the 60s and the 70s and the 80s to describe a new understanding of marriage, uh, challenging monogamy and exclusivity and permanency, that marriage should last only as long as the love lasts. Uh, that love is all that it takes to make a family. Uh, gays and lesbians simply took that logic and extended it to its logical conclusion. If marriage need not be permanent, if marriage need not be exclusive, if marriage need not be monogamous, why does it need to be a union of sexually complementary spouses? And so Kennedy looks at the high rates of the hookup culture, of the normalization of premarital sex, of the wide embrace of non-marital childbearing, the high rates of divorce, the introduction of no-fault divorce laws, challenging all of those historic marital norms, monogamy, exclusivity, <laughs> permanence. And then he says, well, sexual complementarity doesn't seem to matter all that much either. So there's a certain logic to it. The bumper sticker, love equals love. The red equals sign that many of you might have put up as your Facebook or Twitter avatar during oral arguments in the week of the decision. Those all have a certain logical uh, connection if you have a certain vision of marriage as being primarily about consensual adult, romantic, <clears throat> emotional union, and then caregiving that the consenting adults most desire. My argument is that this has been a series of blunders. Uh, that while undoubtedly we have had some improvements over the 50 years, I'm not going to suggest uh, that if we just turn back the clock, everything would be better. Uh, I'm not that type of a conservative here or not. But I am going to suggest that the hookup culture, the rates of non-marital childbearing, uh, as Professor Macedo pointed out, 40 to 50% of all marriages ending in divorce, those are not good things for America's children, for parents, and for society as a whole. And yet there is a certain ideology or a certain philosophy about marriage and human sexuality that undergirds those phenomena, that it can explain why they have been widely embraced. And they've been embraced apart from economic considerations. Uh, it's not just that we are now in the middle of a recession that explains this. We've gone through greater recessions. We've gone through a depression, and we didn't see this similar phenomenon. It's both a confluence of economic or material factors and spiritual or ideological or intellectual factors. It's a confluence of both. Why do I mention the Moynihan Report? Why do I mention the divergent family structures? What got me and my co-authors originally interested in this debate wasn't primarily the same-sex part. It was the marriage part. We saw that the redefinition of marriage would do damage to the institution of marriage because it would enshrine this vision of marriage into our law and that this vision of marriage would be what would be taught both by popular culture and by the government through the pedagogical function, the teaching function of the law in public schools and universities. And it would come, we haven't gotten to the last part of tonight's subtitle, Religious Liberty, and it would come at the expense of the equal freedom of Orthodox Jews and Roman Catholics and Evangelical Christians and Latter-day Saints to live out their beliefs about marriage in the public square free from government coercion and penalty. That's what initially got us in this debate. Uh, so let me, I want to make three uh, broad uh, points in the time that I have uh, in this Lincoln-Douglas debate. I'll just point out that Lincoln and Douglas each had like hours. Uh, the Lincoln-Douglas debates went on for like four or five hours, and Munoz has limited us to 20 minutes, uh, which just shows you the lowering of standards in Professor Munoz's classes. <laughs> he was on my dissertation committee, and that's why I'm a doctor. <laughs> Choose your teacher's wisely. Um, all right, so I'm going to make just three points. One, I want to talk about the uh, Supreme Court's decision itself. Uh, two, I want to talk about the future of marriage. And then three, the future of gay rights and religious liberty. Uh, the first is that, uh, about the Supreme Court decision. <coughs> Professor Racino said that it was principles of liberty, equality, and justice uh, that propelled the Supreme Court's decision. And he thought it rightly was decided uh, to redefine marriage in all 50 states and to say the Constitution required this. I disagree with that. I don't think there's anything in the U.S. Constitution that tells us what sort of content consenting adult relationship is a marital relationship. I think, as Professor Macedo conceded, that there are good arguments on both sides. Uh, he conceded that the new natural argument is a reasonable argument, even though he disagrees with it. Uh, he even cited in his defense Paul Griffiths, who said that it's a valid argument, it's a true argument, 
even though he doesn't think it's a persuasive argument in these cultural settings. But if it's a valid argument, and if it's a true argument, how can it not be a publicly reasonable argument? Are you really going to say that true and valid arguments are somehow publicly unreasonable? It just strikes me that even on the best of Rawlsian line drawing, you can't accomplish that task. So what we had here were two competing visions of what marriage is. Uh, the vision of marriage that Professor Macedo has laid out ably tonight, so I won't repeat it. And then a competing conception of marriage, a conception of marriage that Professor Finnis, Professor George, uh, Sharif, and myself laid out uh, in the book that Justice Alito cited, uh, the What is Marriage book. In that book, what we argue, it's not quite that it's the baby-making sex. I think Professor Macedo uh, misdescribes uh, our argument. It's that there's an act that unites spouses comprehensively. The central thesis of our book is that marriage is a comprehensive union and that it's comprehensive in the three respects that Aristotle tells us we can analyze any type of society, any type of community. Aristotle tells us we can analyze communities in terms of the actions that they engage in, the goods that they are ordered towards, and then the norms that govern their lives, the commitments that they make to one another. <coughs> we argue that this other conception of marriage, called the comprehensive union or conjugal conception of marriage, is comprehensive in those three respects. There's a comprehensive act that unites spouses level of hearts, minds, and bodies. And the reason this matters is that the body is part of who we are. We need to have a sound philosophical anthropology to understand the nature of the human person. Uh, we're not just kind of Cartesian minds that somehow inhabit bodies. We're not simply souls that make use of the machine and the matter. We're a psychosomatic unity. Uh, and Aristotle's uh, uh, terminology from the, 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 the commentary would be a, a hylomorphic union, the soul-body union, uh, matter and form, to have one unified entity. Therefore, to unite comprehensively with another person is going to require union at all levels of that personhood. It won't just be an emotional or a romantic or a dispositional union uh, the way that most of our human interactions are. Your best friend, your roommate, your teammate, uh, your lab partner, you're not uniting bodily with them. Uh, you're going to have an affective, <coughs> an emotional, maybe a romantic, maybe an intellectual union, maybe a dispositional union, not the bodily union. The bodily union is what's distinctive to the marital union because marriage is going to be a comprehensive way of uniting with another person. And so we argue that there's a certain type of act that makes a husband and a wife one flesh, that what the book of Genesis is talking about is not distinctive sectarian revelation, but it is revealing something that's true about human nature, that at the physical and the metaphysical level, a man and a woman, when they unite in that conjugal act, truly become one entity. They become one entity to such a great extent that very often, nine months later, it will require a name. That the lovemaking act is also the life-giving act tells us something about what the comprehensive act is ordered for. It's ordered towards the comprehensive good of the creation of new life and then the raising of new life to maturity. This is where we make the point with the three months. It's not to denigrate same-sex relationships. It's to say that there's no intrinsic connection between a same-sex relationship and the procreation and then rearing of new life. Just as there's no intrinsic relationship between being a member of a religious community and then taking care of new life. An order of nuns or an order of brothers could run an orphanage, but that's an accidental relationship. If you think about the essence accidental, the essential accidental uh, dichotomy within Aristotle's understanding. So it's not that we're denigrating same-sex partners. We're saying that insofar as there's a connection between marriage and family life, Professor Macedo's philosophy of marriage can't explain it. It's an optional add-on for those who choose it. It might be a nice addition for some people, but there's no intrinsic connection between the act that unites spouses and the act that creates new life. We argue that this tells us something of the nature of marriage, that this union, this unitive and the procreative aspect go together. Then we argue that this also can explain uh, the norms that govern marriage. Why is it that you haven't committed till death do you part to your roommate? Why is it that you don't have an exclusive relationship with your gym partner? What is it about marriage that calls for monogamy, exclusivity, and permanency? We say that marriage is a union that is a comprehensive relationship, so it's comprehensive throughout time, which explains that pledge of permanency. 
till death do us part, and that it's a comprehensive union in every moment of time so that it excludes all others. In the traditional uh, wedding vows, forsaking all others, I take thee as my lawfully wedded spouse. And with respect to what is it exclusive? It's not with respect to academic activities, because the academic action is not what's distinctive of marriage. It's not with respect to athletic activities, because it's not an athletic action that's distinctive of marriage. So if you went to the gym today with a gym buddy other than your spouse, if you're attending this lecture with someone other than your spouse, you're not cheating on your spouse. If you sleep with someone tonight, and I, I know it's Mardi Gras, and we're on a Catholic <laughs> campus, but it's no Mardi Gras. If you sleep with someone other than your spouse, you would be cheating on your spouse. Because it's that sexual act that transforms ordinary human relationships, that union of hearts and minds, into the comprehensive domain, a union of bodies as well. And that's why that sexual act, that conjugal act, has also been called the marital act. That there's a distinction, distinctive action that is distinctive of marriage. Now, we don't have time tonight to go into which of these two visions of marriage is true or the best, uh, and to respond to all the arguments and counterarguments. Uh, both Professor Macedo and I have done this in print. There are new books that are for sale afterwards. All I'm going to say is that five unelected Supreme Court justices have no greater ability of knowing the truth about the nature of marriage than everyone in this auditorium tonight. And that there's nothing in the text or the logic or the history or the structure of the US Constitution that would have answered this question in Professor Macedo's favor. This is simply one of those questions to which the US Constitution doesn't speak. And where the Constitution is silent, we the people, as full and equal citizens of a self-governing republic, retain constitutional authority to make law and public policy. That I would imagine everyone on the Notre Dame campus is in favor of marriage equality. The only thing we disagree about is what sort of consenting adult relationship is a marriage. And so it's only if you can answer the question, what is marriage, can you then say whether any given marriage policy is respecting marriage equality or denying marriage equality. Since the Constitution doesn't answer that question, since Professor Macedo has conceded that there were good arguments on both sides of this debate, it should have been settled democratically five unelected judges shouldn't have made marriage policy for the entire nation. Let me move to the second uh, point that I want to make. What is the future of marriage a result of this? Unfortunately, I don't think the second half of Professor Macedo's new book is very successful. And we didn't hear as much about that tonight. But in the second half of his book, he explains why he thinks marriage, the first half he criticizes people like me. And he says, this is why I think marriage should be the union of two adults, irrespective of sexual complementarity. Uh, so I don't think the male-female part is essential to marriage. I think two men, two women, a man and a woman, it's all the same on my vision of marriage. But in the second half of the book, he responds to his liberal and progressive critics. You know, he responds to the Bernie Sanders of marriage philosophy. And he says, wait a minute, let's not get too far ahead of ourselves. People who want to have polygamy and polyamory and all sorts of other consenting adult re uh, relationships recognize as marriages. Professor Macedo is saying, no, let's not go too far. I don't think that works because I do think that the logic of Justice Kennedy's opinion would extend to throuples and quartets, wed leases, and monogamous relationships. And if you don't know what those words mean, let me just briefly uh, uh, clue you in. They're not my creations. They're all the creations of prominent intellectual publications on the political left. Uh, the first is the term throuple. Uh, throuple was introduced to me and my co-authors in New York Magazine. It's a prominent <coughs> Uh, magazine for New York City. What it is is uh, this was a case of three men in Brooklyn who live with each other and they love each other. They've made a commitment to each other. They cook meals for each other. They sleep with one another. They want to have a joint checking account. They want to file a joint ch uh, a tax return. If one of them gets sick, both of them want to have hospital visitation rights. They want to co-inherit wealth if one of them would unfortunately pass away. On the revisionist view of marriage, where it's about consenting adult romance and caregiving and commitment and lovemaking, they have a marriage. If you look at all of the arguments that Justice Kennedy makes in the Obergefell decision, they apply just as equally to the throuple as they do to the couple. Uh, 
Chief Justice John Roberts uh, states this rather uh, blatantly. He says, Kennedy randomly inserts the adjective true throughout his opinion, but he never defends it or justifies it. The reason why is that the true sum requirement in marriage in Western law and culture has been based on the human reality that it's one man and one woman who can unite in an act as one flesh. It's that marital action that has the capacity to create new life, and every new life has one mother and one father. And governments were interested in getting men and women to commit to each other permanently and exclusively so those kids would have moms and dads. Once the Supreme Court says the male-female part of marriage is irrational, arbitrary, perhaps bigoted, certainly unconstitutional, what is your legal principle for limiting marriage to monogamous couples? And how will you argue that at the Supreme Court? Next is the term monogamish. Monogamish relationship is a true person relationship. That's the mono part, mono meaning one, the two becoming one. And then the ish at the end being it's a sexual open relationship. Uh, this was in the New York Times Sunday Magazine, a profile of the gay rights activist Dan Savage. The argument here, he was saying straight couples can learn from gay couples the virtue of the sexually open relationship. Uh, the title of the essay at the New York Times was Married, comma, with Infidelities. And his argument was heterosexuals have this uptight, outdated notion of fidelity, and marriage would be much better if the interpersonal aspect, the caregiving, the romance, was between two people, but the sexual part was open to additional partners, and that gay relationships were particularly equipped at doing this and they could teach straight people how to do it. Last is the term wed lease. Uh, this was introduced in the Washington Post uh, the month after the Windsor decision, the decision on the Defense of Marriage Act. Here was a lawyer saying the problem with marriage is that we expect it to be permanent. But nothing in life is permanent. Everything is transitory. What we need is to have temporary marriage licenses, wed leases instead of wedlock. And on a certain vision of marriage where it's consenting adult romance and caregiving, where the consenting adults set the term of the relationship however they most prefer it, it's unclear what would explain why marriage ought to be permanent and why the law should privilege permanent sexual relationships over temporary relationships. This is where I don't think we've heard enough from those in favor of same-sex marriage why they would limit it to just two people in a permanent and exclusive relationship. And increasingly, if you look at the academic literature and the popular literature, they're saying there is no reason to limit it as such. Um, last week, I was at UC Santa Barbara. The weather is much better than South Bend in the month of <laughs> February. Get a chance to go. I was arguing with a philosophy professor there, and he said, yeah, I agree with you. The logical conclusion of Kennedy's opinion is that marriage equality should be extended to throuples and wed leases and monogamish relationships. The state shouldn't play favorites. All I'm going to say about this is that it directly undercuts the justification for government being in the marriage business in the first place. The state's not in the marriage business because it's a sucker for your love lives. The state's not in the marriage business because it cares about the romance of consenting adults. Government's in the marriage business because sexual unions between men and women can create children, and children deserve mothers and fathers. And so governments try to get men and women to commit permanently and exclusively to one another, and then fulfill their obligations to their kids. Because when this doesn't happen, Social costs run high, as Professor Moynihan pointed out 50 years ago, and as endless sociology shows us today. But if you redefine marriage to further undermine those marital norms, and if you introduce new marital alternatives, the thruple, the wed lease, the monogamous relationship, which logically follow on the Obergefell decision, what is the end outcome in terms of social stability, in terms of social flourishing for American families? The throuple, the wed lease, the monogamous relationship increase the number of sexual partners that men and women have. They decrease the amount of commitments they make to each other. They increase the likelihood of fragmented families and fatherless children. And yet we are without the intellectual resources to explain why the vision of marriage that would undergird them is a faulty vision of marriage. Another way of understanding this is that in the aftermath of the Moynihan Report, as well as today, the most urgent social familial problem in the United States is father absentee-ness, uh, father, father, absentee fathers. How do we teach as a society that fathers are essential when the Supreme Court has redefined marriage to make fathers optional? The message of marriage now, the pedagogical function of marriage after the Obergefell decision, <coughs> that men and women are interchangeable, mothers and fathers are replaceable. 
Uh, and perhaps during the Q&A, we can go into some of the personal testimonies in this. I have two minutes left, so I just want to jump to the Rubus Liberty point. Professor Macedo opened by citing Justice Kennedy in the Bowers v. Hardwick decision as saying that, quote, the majority, uh, the case was about, quote, the majority using power of the state to enforce its sexual morality. And Justice Kennedy said no. The question now, after Obergefell, is will the majority use the, use the power of the state to enforce its sexual morality on Orthodox Jews, Roman Catholics, Evangelicals, Latter-day Saints, and Muslims? What we have already seen are Catholic charity adoption agencies have been shut down, not because they were trying to prevent gays and lesbians from adopting from other agencies, but because they were trying to place the children in their agency with moms and dads, and the state said, that's illegal discrimination. It violates gay rights. Last year, an evangelical school in Massachusetts was under investigation by its accrediting agency because it has a campus policy that expects chastity from all members of the community, and it understands chastity as sex being reserved for marriage, marriage being defined the way the Bible defines it. Right now, Brigham Young University's law school is under investigation by the American Bar Association, whether or not it should retain its accreditation as a law school, because they have a campus policy that governs Mormon life in accordance with Mormon doctrine. And then there are a number of stories of bakers, florists, photographers, people of faith who have no problem serving gays and lesbians, no problem employing gay and lesbians, but they do have a problem to helping celebrate a same-sex wedding, because they believe that would be using their God-given artistic gifts and talents to help celebrate what they believe violates the nature of marriage. They have been fined in both their personal and professional capacities. Uh, in one case, in Oregon, an evangelical family has been fined $135,000 for not baking a same-sex wedding cake. If this isn't an example of the majority imposing its sexual morality on the minority and driving them out of business and forcing them out of their livelihood, unable to fulfill their professional vocations, I don't know what is. And I would just suggest that in the aftermath of Obergefell, we should be able to agree to disagree. Uh, one of the nice things about doing these exchanges with Professor Macedo is that we disagree. We're not particularly dis disagreeable about it. We think this conversation should continue. We wouldn't want either of us to be part of an institution that lost its nonprofit tax status or accreditation or its standing in civil society as a free, equal member of society because of our disagreement over marriage. And I would suggest that that would continue throughout public policy at large. Thank you. Oops. Uh, how much time do I have left? Five. Five minutes. Okay, this is Lincoln Douglas. I'm Lincoln, he's Douglas. I broke this. So thanks. I mean, just a, a couple of, of points, and I'll, I'll kind of respond directly to some of the things that Ryan said. Now, now, one of the core claims he wants to make is that the Heterosexual Sex Act is inherently ordered, intrinsically ordered, towards procreation, the good of new life, and permanence, monog permanence monogamy, uh, and uh, fidelity in marriage. I, I think these are all stipulations, with all due respect. There are certainly stipulations in an era and in a country in which Heterosexual couples are free to use contraceptives. If you're free to use contraceptives, you're free to decide uh, whether your sex acts are oriented towards procreation or not. Uh, it's up to you. There are heterosexual couples who marry in this country who choose not to have children. Their sexual acts, by choice, are not oriented towards procreation. They're oriented towards fulfillment uh, in the same way that same-sex sexual acts will be. I will also stipulate this. Ryan said that same-sex couples lack the complementarity of uh, heterosexual couples. Well, same-sex couples are complementary to one another. <laughs> Their sex acts are complementary to one another. Their relationship is a union of minds and bodies. And when they decide to enter into a marital commitment, they want uh, their relationship to be one that is comprehensive, that builds a life in common together, uh, and that uh, participates in the institution of this building of a life in common uh, together. So uh, uh, I, I don't think that the, uh, uh, the philosophical analysis that Ryan, Ryan's offering is adequate to answer the practical questions in which it's up to us to construct the institution of marriage. Now, the other thing that Ryan constantly describes is marriage is a two-in-one flesh, flesh communion originating in the book of Genesis. Well, polygamy is practiced in the Old Testament. Uh, you know, the fact that 
uh, marriage is a two-in-one flesh communion doesn't prevent society from deciding that a polygamous relationship can still be a marriage. If two-ness makes sense in marriage, and I think it does, it's because of the kind of relationship that a marriage is under conditions of equality in which men and women are equal. Which is why, even though Ryan quotes all of these people on throuples and monogamish and all this stuff, we live in a large country. Obviously, people do disagree. Uh, obviously, there are people that have views about sexual essence that are extremely diverse in this country, in Greenwich Village and San Francisco and South Bend and, and uh, Salt Lake City and so on. I mean, we live in a very large and diverse country. I mean, you could pick people out of the uh, New York Magazine, which he makes sound like a, a liberal intellectual journal. Well, they basically advertise movies and, uh, and plays and so on in New York City uh, as a kind of local uh, magazine. I mean, you could pick out people saying all sorts of things. Dan Savage, who did talk about in his book, I think his book was called The Commitment or something like that, was also interviewed. He had two discreet threesomes uh, with his partner before they had children. Uh, and uh, I, I don't think they've ever repeated that. Anyway, it was kind of you know, an experiment and so on. But believe me, uh, these uh, uh, experiments and open relationships are decades old uh, and, and, and uh, have been uh, experimented with in heterosexual society as well as homosexual society. We're, we're all free to, uh, to criticize those kinds of relationships, perhaps think they're bad for the relationship, but we live in a large, diverse country, and I don't see the point in firing uh, same-sex couples with, uh, with, with, with uh, the brush that suggests, through that kind of example, perhaps, that they can't practice fidelity in their relationships. Um, uh, uh, and so uh, it seems to me that uh, if we want to strengthen marriage, and I, I believe in that, the best way to do it is to get past the argument about same-sex marriage. The real crisis of marriage nowadays in the United States, and Ryan goes back to the Moynihan Report quite, quite uh, appropriately, the real crisis of marriage in this country is a class-based marriage. Among the college-educated, uh, take couples that are marrying, both of whom have had college degrees, the typical pattern is that people are waiting to marry until the man is in his late 20s, the woman is in sort of mid to late 20s. So 27 years old has been the median age for, I think, a man at marriage now, around 25 for a woman. They're finishing their degrees, they're starting their careers, and they're waiting to have children until after they marry. They're also overwhelmingly cohabiting and having sex, but they're waiting to have uh, children until after they've married. And those marriages among college-educated people in this country are stable, more egalitarian than the past. The, the men do, the fathers do more help with child rearing, not as much as the women. Uh, but they're more egalitarian, but, and the marriages are very stable. Those people are also overwhelmingly in favor of same-sex marriage, but, but, but be that as it may. The divorce rates in those marriages among college-educated people who are waiting to marry, thinking about it, settling down, planning for the future, are as, as the divorce rate is as low as back in the uh, mid-60s. On the other hand, among high school dropouts and those with only some high, high school dropouts or those with only a high school degree, in part because of the economic insecurity uh, that those couples face, and in part because they have a more traditional view of the husband as breadwinner, and, and because of the economic issues, they can't enter into that. They're typically sort of cohabiting, uh, often sort of drifting into uh, a, a pregnancy uh, without fully planning it, but having children before marriage. And though there's hopes for those relationships to be stable, they tend to be much less stable uh, than uh, either married, having children within marriage, and their marriages also tend to be less stable. So the, a very high proportion of children among that socioeconomic demographic being born outside of wedlock. And the challenges to mothers, predominantly in those circumstances, are extremely great. And this points to a widening class divide in the future, because the college-educated people who are having children are hyper-parents. You know, they engage in intense parenting, and children benefit enormously from that in the early stages of development. On the other hand, uh, uh, well, mothers predominantly raising children in economically challenged circumstances uh, uh, have more challenges in terms of, of uh, cognitive development, and it points to a widening class divide in the future. So that's the real crisis of marriage in this country. And it seems to me that the debate over same-sex marriage is a distraction from it, not a way of engaging with it. I think the debate over same-sex marriage, frankly, is giving marriage a bad name among large parts of the population. One of the things that the Putnam and Campbell book found, American Grace, David Campbell, who's a professor in this department, found that the sort of right-wing politicization of religion in the 1980s and 90s turned off a lot of young people with respect to religion. I kind of suspect that the politicization of marriage in opposing same-sex marriage is also turning off some young people with respect to marriage. Anyway, I will conclude that, but I want to thank Ryan for his uh, always eloquent uh, comments 
And uh, thanks again to Vincent uh, and, and, and the organizers. Okay, thank you to both of you. Um, Rajini's going to be circulating with a um, uh, microphone, uh, so uh, we realize that not everyone might be able to text, especially faculty, so uh, we're going to have a Opposable thumbs? Let, let me say for the record, uh, Dr. Anderson was right. Uh, the Lincoln Douglas debates were three hours, and if Lincoln was here, he'd have three hours. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Douglas. <laughs> we have. Uh, Alex Renko has, uh, class of 2018, has uh, asked questions for both of you, several questions. So let me uh, get both of his questions out. Um, uh, the first, uh, to you, Professor Macedo, I'll, I'll ask both questions and then you can respond in turn. Um, Professor Macedo, what would you say to those who argue that marriage is a privilege and not really a right, an entitlement? Uh, the, uh, Justice Thomas and his dissent in Obergefell took this position. And then uh, Alex's question for you, Ryan. Uh, do you think the Supreme Court case that universally legalized inter interracial marriage was also uh, the Supreme Court overstepping its, its power? Yeah, I, I think that, uh, uh, that, that uh, once the public decides at least to establish the institution of marriage, uh, we can't exclude people from it on arbitrary grounds. We have to make it fairly available fairly to those who can benefit from it and participate in its good. Uh, and I think that's become clear that heterosexual couples who wish to marry can participate in the good of marriage, can make the same sort of marital commitment uh, that, heter that, that, homos that, that heterosexual couples do, other, can make that same sort of commitment, benefit from it in the same way. Uh, and, uh, and that the, um, uh, so I, I think given that the institution of marriage exists, it has to be made fairly available. Now the issue then will be, well, what about throuples and morsums and so on? Uh, there is no broad social movement in this country in favor of plural marriage. The Mormons are not pressing for it. Muslim Americans are not pressing for it. Uh, there is no uh, polyamorous community. You know, there's not a single empirical study of polyamory in this country. There's anecdote and speculation. And frankly, it's being generated by the political right and admittedly by some people on the political left who are, who are, uh, who are you know, uh, against marriage. Uh, uh, but well, all we have is anecdote and speculation. And these tend to be, frankly, fluid adult relationships that have something to do with sex and companionship and so on. But they don't have the permanence of marriage. They, they don't involve a commitment to live a life together. And we're entitled, I think, to design the institution of marriage, I think, recognizing that same-sex couples do want to participate in it. But we have nothing like the same sort of testimony and evidence and, and that comes with the democratic social movement with respect to throuples and morsums. You haven't heard those words because they're just you know, sort of there in People magazine and on the Jerry Springer show and things like that. Uh, 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 and, and as they say, there is no country in the world in which there's any broad social, not, Amsterdam, not the Netherlands, nowhere. And again, it's, it's basically nowhere that women are equal is there any movement back towards plural marriage. It's just a fact. It used to be the dominant marital form under patriarchal societies, under, quite, under conditions of, of gender equality. There is no uh, movement back towards, towards plural marriage. Monogamy reigns. So I, I rely on history and social scientific evidence uh, in, uh, in supporting that conclusion with respect to plural marriage. Well, do you mind if I follow that? Uh, there's another question that's a natural follow-up to just what you said. How, uh, <clears throat> you know, paraphrase the question that was posed. How, uh, how is your response to the thruple yeah. uh, uh, using an abstraction not akin to what you accuse Ryan of doing to the three monks? Right? Well, the th Why are you talking about the real lives of, of real people? Yeah, okay. No, I do. To be honest, uh, in the book, I look at Deborah Ample, who's one of the leading sources for this. Uh, she talks about it and other people that look at it. Deborah Anna Paul is a, a practitioner of, uh, she calls it mind pelvic, uh, sorry, heart pelvic integration. She's a kind of sexual sex therapist from California. She actually, I don't think she pressed for marriage rights. Uh, she, she wanted uh, to recognize the goodness of, you know, these kinds of open sexual relationships. Uh, but I, I, you know, she didn't advocate for marriage rights. And, uh, uh, it's not clear to me that the people, that the few people that are living this life, we, this is a social, this is a, marriage is a social form. So there have to be large numbers of people involved before we create the space for, uh, for altering this. And part of the problem is that we do have experience of plural marriage of the polygamous form, one husband with multiple wives, and it has the malign tendencies that I suggested. Violence in the home, violence in society, and privileging rich males over, over poorer males. 
Plus, we have the principal considerations that the preference for plural marriage is not an orientation. Anyone might like to bring a, an additional person into their relationship, and it's highly variable depending upon the, the laws of the society. It's not consistent with two-ness in marriage, which is the condition for the flourishing of egalitarian marriage. It's not consistent with fair equality of opportunity to enter into the good of marriage. And it would, unlike same-sex marriage, degrade marital assurance. The, the fundamental uh, nature of marriage is to commit and settle down with another person. If all of a sudden it became possible to bring a third person into your marriage, that would degrade the marital assurances that people now have, uh, uh, that that's not a possibility. So polygamy would undermine marital assurances that are essential to marriage in a way that same-sex marriage doesn't, because it's not an option for straight people to decide they want to have a same-sex marriage. Right, I want to uh, uh, invite you to comment on that question and also uh, loving the, the Sure. Uh, so, so I'll take that question first. I'm actually a little bit shocked. I, I don't think Professor Masita would say quite what he just said if this was an audience at Princeton. Um, because I think he would have gotten pushback from a Princeton audience of philosophers and social scientists saying, Professor Masita, you're doing exactly what you accuse the conservatives of doing to gays and lesbians, except you're now stereotyping polyamorous and polygamous people. Well, they're not enough of them, so they don't get their human rights. Well, we don't grant human rights to people unless there's a social movement demanding it. Uh, you're saying that, well, they don't really want marriage because they don't, they don't want commitments. I mean, it's a series of stereotypes that he would never have gotten away with, or I would have never gotten away with it. I would have opened up here saying, well, gays don't want this, or they can't do it. My argument wasn't that gays and lesbian couples are incapable of commitment. I expressly say they can. I say that Professor Macedo's philosophy of marriage can't explain why that commitment is required. So his response to me tonight was saying, you know, of course gays and lesbians can aspire to these sorts of permanent monogamous and uh, exclusive unions. We can see that in the very beginning of our book. What we say is that the revisionist theory of marriage can't explain why there are requirements. And so to then say, well, you know, these polygamous polyamorous people, they're fringe groups, they're part of these People magazine. Well, they're not. I mean, so Cambridge University Press has published a book saying that there's a stronger constitutional argument for polyamorous marriage than there is for same-sex marriage. Emory Law Review has uh, devoted an entire issue of the Law Review to this question. Professor Macedo devotes the entire second half of his book to responding to these arguments. The last third. The last <laughs> third of the book to responding to these arguments. So I don't see how we can have it both ways and say these are fringe arguments from people in their pajamas blogging in their parents' basement, in and then say, well, it's actually it's the New York Times, it's the Washington Post, it's Politico, it's Slate, it's Salon, it's New York Magazine, it's academic presses. You can't have it both ways, I don't think. And I don't think the response that he's given us tonight is sufficient. If I'm in a three-person male relationship, I don't see how patriarchy or gender equality factors in one way or the other. Right? We're not going to be domineering a female member of our union if it's three guys. Or if it's two guys and two women, the example Alito gave during oral arguments, he said, assume there are four lawyers, so they all know their legal rights, two men and two women, they want to have marriage equality, what's the argument against it? The lawyer couldn't give an argument against it. And I don't think Professor Macedo has given us an argument against it without resorting to stereotypes or about the way that polygamy has historically been practiced. But because the way that, his, that polygamy historically has been practiced, there's no reason to deny people their fundamental equality rights to have a thruple or a Wedley's or monogamous relationship. So that, that's what I'll say on that uh, uh, second part. On the first question about Loving v. Virginia, I think there are two things at least that separate it from the Obergefell consideration. Uh, the Explain what Loving is. Loving v. Virginia was a decision by the U.S. Supreme Court that struck down the, the remaining bans on interracial marriage. I think Loving v. Virginia is both a just decision and a constitutionally sound decision. Uh, and I think you can understand this in two ways. One is that we had expressly <laughs> amended the Constitution uh, to respond to racism. And we had various legislation at the federal government level to respond to racism. So the, this is why uh, race has been elevated to a suspect class uh, for Supreme Court jurisprudence purposes. It's a protected class. It gets a heightened level of scrutiny. Uh, we, that's not the way that federal jurisprudence treats sexual orientation. That's not the way there are no federal laws on that question. So there's a difference there about both legislatively and the types of amendments that we made in the Constitution after the abolition of slavery. Second, though, uh, even when you are engaging in that heightened uh, form of scrutiny, there are no plausible philosophical arguments whatsoever about marriage that has skin color relevant at all. There's not a single great thinker in all of human history that has ever made any plausible argument that race or ethnic heritage or skin color has any bearing on marriage. 
Marriage is a colorblind institution, but it's not a genderblind institution, precisely because, as the loving court said, a man and a woman can unite as one flesh, irrespective of their race. They can create a child irrespective of their race, and that child deserves a mother and a father irrespective of the race. So they said there's no rational basis to bans on interracial marriage, therefore they fail even the lowest level of constitutional review, therefore I think it's both a just and a constitutionally sound decision. Okay, I have, <clears throat> I'm gonna invite, uh, if anyone has a question in the audience, I'm gonna invite you to raise your hand so Roger can find you and I'll uh, pose a few more uh, that have come in online. Uh, there's a number of questions for you, Professor Macedo, related to the bit, so you did exactly get to that subject in uh, your, your formal presentation. Um, let me just pose this one uh, in particular, but several questions like it. Uh, this is from Monica Gorman, uh, a senior mathematics and Chinese major. Um, Professor Macedo, do you see the gay rights movement, uh, gay rights movement's tendency to go after dissenters, dissenters like Brandon Ike, the uh, oh, fellow who worked at Zilla, as a problem, and if so, do you have a solution? Do you think this is a tendency, th do you think this tendency is a natural consequence of the argument for gay rights? No, I don't think it's a tendency of a natural argument for gay rights. I think Brendan like, shouldn't have been uh, forced out of his job without question. As I understand it, that was, they, they were concerned about publicity uh, and it was a management decision that was made within the company perhaps, but I, I, I think that's inappropriate obviously. I think at the time he gave the contributions. Six not, years prior. Six years prior, and, and there was no evidence that he ever discriminated against anybody and so on. No, I, I, I'm not in favor of, of those kinds of witch hunts, and I think we should be uh, more respectful of, of disagreements. Uh, the religious liberty issue in general, I think, is not an easy one. It seems to me there's a strong case for exceptions when it comes to wedding photographers. I think there's a very good wedding photographers that have been involved in the wedding and almost participates in celebrating the wedding and uh, artistically and in uh, commemorating the wedding. On the other hand, a county clerk who's taken an, uh, an oath to obey the law should obey the law. It's not her personal decision. And in that case, the Kim Davis case, she not only refused to sign the wedding, she refused to allow anyone in her office to sign them. Who was willing to sign them? I mean, she didn't, she could have easily made, it, made the certificates available without her having to sign them herself, or at least that, that would be a way of a workaround with respect to that. So in between, there are gonna be lots of difficult issues. I think it's important, as it was with racial issues, that people be able to go into public uh, businesses that serve the public and be served if they're respectful members of the public. We don't want restaurants saying, no, we don't serve gays, we don't serve Jews, we don't serve uh, traditionalist Catholics. Uh, and, and so I, I, I actually think this is an area where we need sort of fine-grained analysis rather than very sweeping principles. Uh, but based on principles of Sure, but let, let me, um, and I'll, I'll let you follow up as well. What about um, colleges and accreditation and universities? Yeah, I don't know anything about the, uh, the Brigham Young case. Uh, I don't know anything about the Brigham Young case. So, 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 so do you think they're in a similar situation to Bob Jones University? Uh, no, I mean, uh, but again, they, I don't know what it is that, uh, we don't know what policy it is that's being objected to. So uh, uh, let's say in, in, uh, in BYU, the, the university has a policy of chastity is expected of all university right. members. Right. Um, so there's right. no, there, it's a uniform policy, right. heterosexual and right. homosexuals, right. no sex outside of marriage. Right. They define marriage the way that Mormons define marriage. Right, right, right. No, I, Is I, that I, a reason to lose their accreditation or their tax status? Yeah, I, I don't think so. I haven't really had a conversation for them. So can I say I one thing? I, I just bought the cup. I don't know the details. No. Yep. So the only thing I want to add on the Kim Davis uh, situation is that what Professor Macedo just described is actually what Kim Davis had asked for. Um, I followed this case very closely. I wrote an op-ed for the New York Times about it. Kim Davis said, I have no problem if a deputy clerk in my office issues the marriage license. I just don't want my name on the license. Um, that was what she had requested. She ended up going to jail for it. Um, the state of Kentucky has, religion, has, has conscience exemptions for county clerks who believe in animal rights and animal welfare. They don't have to issue in their name hunting licenses. And the original Kentucky marriage license prior to Obergefell said husband and wife. And after the Supreme Court redefined marriage, it said party one and party two. All she asked for was the removing of her name as county clerk from the uh, uh, license. When she got out of jail, that's exactly the compromise that the judge allowed to go forward. And when the new governor, who ran on a platform of accommodating Kim Davis, won his election in November, that was one of the first pieces of an executive action that he issued. So even in the Kim Davis situation, I think we can find an accommodation in which every legally eligible citizen in the state of Kentucky is getting a marriage license 
and no clerk is being forced to violate his or her beliefs. And I think whenever we can find those solutions, we should try to find them. Okay. Um, well, I'm going to take the prerogative here. I'm going to push you guys over. Okay, right. fine. Um, uh, I, and this is yep. not a hypothetical. Hey, I don't right. know if this is going on at BYU. Married student housing, mm -hmm. not usually something that uh, involves undergraduates, but graduate students, law students. Uh, especially here in Notre Dame, law students, professional students. If a university would, uh, so a legally married uh, same sex couple right. applies for married housing, Brigham Young or some other university says, uh, we don't extend married housing to a same sex couple. We understand you're legally married, but we don't uh, believe in the law there. Is that an issue that could uh, lead to penalties, even loss of accreditation? Is that uh, again, I don't know. I mean, uh, I'm not in favor of, uh, I, I think we're, uh, you know, I think we're at a point now where, where we should uh, be cutting slack and so on and not. Uh, I hesitate to address these issues without knowing the whole set, set of issues, but um, I wouldn't be eager to go there, certainly. Fair enough. Um, okay. And, uh, I mean, I, on the other hand, you know, I, you know yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, what's the other hand? Well, it's a matter, yeah. Well, I'd have to think about what public benefits are being generated and so on, but yeah, I'll just leave it at that. Okay. Uh, and, I, uh, tell us, uh, tell us your, uh, where you are in Notre Dame or if you're a member of the community. Hi, I'm, my name is Mark Summey, and I'm a graduate student in chemical engineering, uh, third year here. Um, so my question is mostly for Dr. Macedo, but also for uh, Dr. Anderson, whom I've actually asked this question before at another one of your talks recently, but you had here. Uh, my question is that you both seem to sort of um, believe in the utility of the law, that the law should be used to teach a moral lesson. Uh, my question is, what, uh, why should your moral lesson be taught as opposed to your opponents, and more particularly, how do you uh, address the fact that um, when your opponent takes office, their moral lesson might be taught? Yeah. Sure, I mean, I, I would just say that um, there's a reason why I work at the Heritage Foundation. I think we should have limited government. So I want the government only legislating when it absolutely has to. Right? So I think the political common good is inherently a limited common good, and the states uh, meant to assure the conditions for it to flourish. But there's no way of kind of abstaining from those judgments of what is good, right? If the state's supposed to protect the conditions for the political common good to flourish, you need an account of what the good is and what the flourishing state of that condition is. If the state's supposed to protect human rights, you need an account of what is the human right at stake here. And so I don't think it's a matter of imposing my views or imposing Professor Macedo's views. What we're both trying to do and what we're all trying to do in this auditorium tonight is figure out what's the truth of the matter. And I think the state and its laws and its policies should reflect and embody the truth of the matter because that's the best way in which the state can help promote the common good, can promote justice, equality, liberty, and human rights. And we're just going to disagree. And the, and the only way that we're going to, you know, depending who's in office and the revolving door of which party is up and down in the polls, is that we have to keep thinking about these things, debating these things, arguing about them, so we get greater and greater and greater in clarity about what a just outcome would be. What I appreciate tonight is that Professor Macedo does not seem inclined at all to go on a witch hunt for people who dissent from gay marriage. I mean, there are people who we could have been having a The person I debated last week said, yeah, you're just like the racist. You should be treated the same way the racists are. That's not his argument, and I, and I want him to win this debate about what's the status of people like me after marriage has been redefined. Uh, extended. Uh, so I agree with you. He sounds, more like, he sounds more like Lincoln than Douglas in, in respect to it. The, the law does morally teach and it has to take a moral stand. And if we adopt a libertarian view, it'll, teach, it'll express and teach a libertarian lesson. I, I do think that uh, monogamous marriage uh, helps to imprint the fiber of equal liberty uh, into our Constitution for all the reasons I've suggested. That the entire history of plural marriage and the history of polygamy, basically, and the history of inequality and conflict, and uh, let me just say this about polygamy. The, the, the historical origins, apparently, in ancient Greece, uh, they're Western but not Christian. They were, con con the thought is that it conduced to the success of the Greek city-states, conduced to the success of the Roman Empire, was picked up by Christianity from there, and has spread across the world along with women's basic rights. So uh, uh, Ataturk in Turkey is part of his modernization, Mao in China, who did believe in state feminism, Japanese is part of their modernization, African countries, as part of their adoption of human rights and women's group across Africa, have pushed to an end to patriarchal polygamous marriage. Uh, so monogamous marriage uh, is, uh, helps to support a regime in which 
the great good of marriage is, is everyone has a fair opportunity to pursue it, including lower status males as well as higher status males, and which marriage is an equal partnership of two people. So it seems to me the Constitution's basic principles of equal liberty uh, uh, support and are supported by the institution of monogamous marriage. And one way in which gender, sorry, which same-sex marriage changes marriage, or at least entrenches its current character, is by being equality in marriage. Uh, with some reason why some traditionalists, not, not Ryan, but some traditionalists oppose same-sex marriage is because they believe in male headship and a sharp distinction between the gender roles, not just with respect to the sex act, but with respect to uh, uh, women's role in marriage. And it seems to me the law there has to stand for equality of opportunity. Women are free to choose traditional roles if they wish, but they should make that choice on the basis of genuinely fair equality of opportunity to decide what kinds of lives and what kind of marriages they want to have. But so it seems to me in this case that the, the, the uh, arguments that I'm supporting are grounded in the Constitution's values of equal liberty, and we don't want to be neutral with respect to those. Can I be? Okay, hold on. Um, Roger, I see there's a hand over here and a hand over there. I'm going to go back to the uh, uh, submitted questions here. One from uh, Tim Bradley, who's a senior here, uh, for uh, Dr. Macedo. Uh, is a sexual relationship essential to marriage, and if so, why? Well, look, I mean, I, I think there are older couples probably and maybe some younger couples that I don't know how often they have sex. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> what do you think? Uh, I mean, uh, it, 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 it's natural. We are embodied beings. Uh, people's lives have a certain trajectory and certain things matter more at some points. There's no question that uh, uh, you know, I think... It, Gay and lesbian couples also fall in love, also want to build a life together. They are also sexual beings. And I don't think the sex act between gay and lesbian is immoral any more than I think that contraceptive sex and heterosexual marriage is immoral. Now, there's, a, there's an alternative view, and it's a respectable view as an ideal sexual ethic as part of a tradition. But I don't, I don't think it should be the basis of the law in our society. And uh, so in that sense, I don't know that, the, you know, that, that sex is essential in a marriage. Love and commitment is essential in a marriage. Again, I don't think it's an emotional bond. This issue did come up from Brown, it's come up from Princeton. It's commitment that's central, not just the fact that I'm, with your, I'm your closest friend or I'm your number one but person. But why, why, can't, why can't the three men make that same commitment? And, and, and why wouldn't I you have that these, three male commitment be recognized in law? I don't see these three men. Well, I mean, I so if, if they were to appear here tonight, what would you say to them? Well, I mean, you don't well, see them as an it's argument. Not, it's not Dan Savage, uh, because, there, because plural relationships are very well known in human history. And they have the character that I described. By the way, the Quran no, no, says no, you cannot be equitable in a plural marriage. The Quran says that, no matter how hard you try. Mormons thought that polygamy should only be available to the elect within the Mormon church, and it should not spread beyond Mormonism because it took special virtue to control the jealousy and conflict that was inherent in plural marriages. Sure. So they were both, not in favor. So both so, of the examples you gave, the Mormons and the Muslims, are talking about polygamy. It's one man with multiple wives. I'm talking about polyamory. I'm talking about three men who live with each other and love each other and commit to each right. other, want to care for each other, have joint checking accounts, tax returns. What is your argument to them for why you're denying them their marriage equality, their equal liberty under the Constitution? My argument is that as things stand, given what we know about the history and, and the nature of plural marriage, as a, as a general social practice, it does not support the goods that go along with monogamous marriage. I'm not in favor of decriminalization. People are free to live together. People, perhaps we should facilitate their uh, entering into certain kinds of, but, but they, they, the, the, the relationship has the, the character that I described of being as a general social form. We're talking about a general social form here, not particular individuals. Well, no, no, and polygamy, but polygamy and polyamory are very different social forms. And so I think your conflation of the two is not doing justice to the differences in the types of relationships. I, I want to get a question in for you here, Ryan, because it corresponds to the one I just asked Professor Macedo, which is um, not a name, uh, but uh, submitted here. Uh, is if procreation is essential uh, to, the, uh, to marriage, what about home heterosexual couples who are unable to procreate? A great question. So on the view that I've been articulating, that my co-authors and I have been developing, procreation is not essential to marriage. What makes a marriage a marriage is a comprehensive union, irrespective of whether 24 hours a sperm fertilizes an egg, irrespective of whether nine months later a child is born. What gets the government interested in marriage is that many of those marriages do result in children. So it's a two-step argument. One is the question is, what is marriage? And the next question is, why does marriage matter for public policy and the law? 
But an infertile couple is a fully married couple precisely because they unite as one flesh, precisely because they engage in that comprehensive act that makes them one entity. And one of the best ways of illustrating this uh, within kind of um, contemporary pop culture is with uh, uh, Downton Abbey three weeks ago. I don't know how many of you have continued watching Downton as the seasons get less and less interesting. <laughs> but <laughs> this is the finale. It's the sixth season, least interesting. And uh, uh, Mr. Bates, the, the uh, not Mr. Bates, uh, the, 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 the head butler. Um, um, Mr. Bates. It is Mr. Bates, yeah. No, Karsten. 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 Right. Uh, Mr. Bates. Karsten. Yeah. They're both uh, in new, newish marriages. But so Karsten is about to get married to Mrs. Hughes. And Mrs. Hughes is a little nervous. She's elderly. She doesn't know how she'll perform in bed. She's old, gravity, all this, right? She's there, all the things weighing on her mind. And she sends in Mrs. The season's ended. <laughs> she sends in Mrs. Patmore to ask Mr. Bates, what is his intention with this marriage? Do they intend to live as brother and sister? Do they just intend to have uh, a union of hearts and minds? And he says, I want a marriage in full. I want to be as close to another human person as two people can be. What is Karsten getting at? He's getting at that we are incarnate creatures. We are embodied souls. And so for two people to be as close to po as possible is to engage in that conjugal act, that marital act. He wants to unite maritally with his spouse, irrespective of whether or not procreation <coughs> is going to be a possibility. And he knows at their age that it's not a possibility. That's what we're getting at. That's, what, that's the reality, the phenomenon that we're trying to capture in our account of what marriage Well, I, I, uh, I would go back to the throuples and so on, but I, but I probably should. Why don't you ask another question? I do have a, uh, go with yeah. And please tell us who you are. I, I'm a first, first year law student. Um, it seems to me that, well, I believe that part of what motivates or animates the, the gay marriage movement is this search for moral legitimacy. Uh, this is already a question addressed to Mr. Anderson. For moral legit legitimacy in regards to gay sex, the sexual act. Um, and, and it, I also believe that because of that, if, if anything, it's the left that politicizes the, the marriage debate. They use marriage as an institution to seek more legitimacy for, essentially, for gay sex. And so I guess my question for Mr. Anderson is if, if that's partly what animates the gay, the gay marriage movement, to what an extent is the answer or the response that gay marriage is impossible um, philosophically? A satisfying response and not confronting the question, okay, gay sex is just wrong. <laughs> right, right. It seems like that's that's gotta be it didn't really come up much yeah. in the debate. Uh, good question. So I mean I think that there there are various motivations uh, for people in favor of same sex marriage. Uh, I think the motivations that Professor Macedo has articulated tonight motivate many people. I'm sure that there are people who are also made, motivated by the considerations you've just presented. And I have no way of knowing what's the majority consideration, what's my, how strong the weight the various considerations. But I think both of those considerations are at play here. Um, how uh, satisfying would this response be? The response that we've made is that we take no position as a public policy matter in the moral status of non-marital sex acts. Uh, we think the same exact sex acts that two men engage in, a man and a woman can engage in, which is why I don't think that the, what hinges on my argument is the nature of a same-sex relationship. It's the nature of the marital act itself. Um, so. Uh, uh, heterosexuals engage in many of the same sex acts that homosexuals engage in. That's not what's at stake here. We are, or at least I'll speak for myself, I am not in favor of any sort of sodomy laws or any sort of like criminalization on consenting adult sexual activity. Um, so I don't think it's you know, the moral status of this that's at stake. I think what's at stake here is well, what, side of, what type of consenting adult sexual relationship is the marital relationship? And that's where I do think that we have to get to this question about the nature of marriage. Um, for people, I do think you're right that for some activists, it is about uh, a, a moral acceptance of same-sex acts and same-sex relationships. And I think that's what propels those people, not Professor Macedo, but others, to sue the baker, the florist, the photographer, to go after Catholic charity adoption agencies, Brigham Young's accreditation, because they see those institutions as not fully approving of their relationships and the sexual choices that they uh, which is why it may be that Professor Macedo gives a different answer to those situations than other people do. So I just said that the, 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 the sex act was legitimated in Lawrence versus Texas, so that's a while back. And within the gay community, obviously, marriage is controversial. I mean, they're, the, the, the strongest sexual liberationists are anti-marriage. Uh, so there's disagreement within the 
the uh, gay community about marriage as there is within the heterosexual community where there are many feminists and others that are also uh, anti-marriage. Uh, okay, I, I have a question here. And Roger, we have one up there. Um, this is a difficult one. I'm curious to see what you do with it. Uh, what, if anything, would uh, convince you to change your mind? Good question. Um, so politically, I think that I would not care about the main kind of uh, pedagogical function of the law if 50 years from now we saw that there was no change in the way in which marriage was actually practiced in the United States, or in fact there were improvements. Um, what mainly makes me concerned about the legal definition of marriage is how I think um, that it's going to impact your generation and your children. Um, if I was convinced that Professor Macedo was right and that this is going to strengthen marriage, that there will be more monogamy, more permanency, more exclusivity, more kids being raised by committed couples, um, then I would say, like, and this is just one of those legal questions where I don't think my philosophy needs to map one-to-one -one with the law. I have all sorts of philosophical and moral beliefs that I don't think the government should be uh, vindicated. But I'm not – I mean, right now I'm not convinced that it's going to play out that way. I think that the dominant worldview – that's been enshrined in this court's decision. And what we're seeing playing out is one much more of sexual liberation of consenting adults doing whatever consenting adults want to do, of consenting teenagers doing whatever consenting teenagers want to do. And I think that's gonna be the um, lesson that is taught by this decision that's already being taught in schools. I think it's not a coincidence that the T in LGBT is now the issue that's being primarily debated at the high school level with respect to bathrooms and locker rooms and sports teams. Um, it's not one of kind of uh, uh, hunkering down on these narrow norms. It's one of uh, a, a certain form of Gnostic understanding of the personal relationship to the body and of the self-creation uh, of an autonomous individual doing whatever autonomous individuals want to do. But 50 years from now, I mean, I'll hopefully still be alive. And if it turns out that Professor Macedo is right, I'll gladly concede that this wasn't an issue that politically would matter. Yeah, I, I, I could change my mind on the, the, the polyamory part if uh, larger numbers of these people became available and it became clear that there was a social form there. I don't read the Obergefell as, as being a radical decision. I read it as being a, a, a moderate decision that extends, I think, the best tradition of conservatism. It makes an adjustment to marriage in order to strengthen it. And I, don't, I wouldn't read much into those kinds of some of the vaguer uh, uh, suggestions in Kennedy's opinion, which he simply avoids the plural marriage issue completely, which is just as well because it wasn't uh, being litigated. It, I, will, I will put the, make, make this point. The criminal prohibition on polygamy, which I'm not particularly in favor of uh, because it just involves people entering religious ceremonies. I'm not in favor of criminalization. But the criminal prohibition on polygamy was upheld in Canada after they had recognized same-sex marriage as a fundamental right. <laughs> So those liberal Canadians up there saw no problem <laughs> because they cared about e equality and they did a, 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 a very serious assessment of uh, plural marriage as an actual social form, not as a fantasy that people write about in, uh, in uh, New York Magazine uh, or elsewhere. They upheld the criminal prohibition there uh, in Canada. And so I think if we're concerned about these other things, I think a lot of them raise separate issues. You mentioned the T in LGBT. Well, there are people who experience their sexuality as alien. Now, some of those had corrective surgery when they were infants, uh, and uh, it was decided by a doctor that they were a boy or a girl, and it was a mis, apparently, it was a misdiagnosis. Now, we need to understand whether these things are stable and so on and so forth, but that raises a whole separate set of issues, and we shouldn't, we shouldn't write them off as part of some sort of Gnosticism. We should investigate them sympathetically uh, and uh, from the point of view of people that have those experiences. Uh, and likewise, uh, uh, other phenomena. We're learning about human sexuality, it seems to me, and, and we ought to be open to learning more, uh, and I'm certainly open to learning more on the, on the polyamory part. I did want to mention that what I've done is to try to pay attention to the way that polyamory is talked about in the academic literature, where the things that people look at are things like a book by Urban Tribes, where it, it turns out that Elizabeth Brake relied on evidence that was 20-somethings living together for a little while in their 20s, and then they got married, to, you know, to not in throuples, but to the usual monogamous relationships. And uh, uh, so, in fact, I think the, uh, the, the examples of poly, uh, evaporate on inspection, and I've investigated those in the academic literature. I think it's a bugaboo we use by the, by, the, by the right, but also by the left, to, to oppose same-sex marriage in one case, and then to suggest 
a preferred form of sexual anarchy. But if we don't want sexual anarchy, we should simply oppose it and talk about the benefits of marriage, recognize it's essentially the same sex couple, and investigate why so many people have left plural marriage behind. Okay, we're going to go uh, last question here. Yeah, my name is Steve Trinier. I'm a senior poli sci econ major here. Um, and my question is, is more about one of the dissents, um, one of the questions raised. And it was, and it was about the future. Um, Professor, or Dr. Macedo, you said that in, in 30 years you were astounded by the, the change in public opinion and, uh, and how the court uh, responded to that. Um, they're unelected officials. They're not supposed to sway to public opinion. Um, so it was, it was a little disconcerting to me uh, reading it that it, it seemed like they bowed to public opinion a little bit and they used sort of broad, uh, this fundamental right under the, the 14th Amendment uh, to, to go through and sort of, you know, yeah, yeah. provide the foundation for marriage equality. Um, like moving forward into the future, say public opinion changes towards polygamy or something else. And, you know, within 30 years, we have a movement for polygamy. I mean, that, that, that's my concern. I don't know how you would address that. And, and again, with the election coming up and some of the judges getting older, um, it is a, a large concern for me, at least, to, uh, to see that unelected officials basically get to decide, um, in a sense, you know, moral policy is you know, one of the questions yeah. earlier. Okay, the role of the court and the legitimacy yeah. of the court doing this as a I mean, you call them unelected, but every modern <laughs> democracy has established judicial review as part of its modern, and they've adopted that by popular ratification of, the con of their constitution, as we did. So it's, uh, the Supreme Court is a legitimate institution under our constitution that plays an important role in democracy. Minority rights protection is part of democracy. It's not anti-democratic. Uh, democratic decision is not legitimate unless everyone's interests are included and everyone's now deciding what constitutes uh, a minority that's discriminated against rather than a privileged group that's claiming special votes requires a moral judgment uh, and uh, it also requires assessing the arguments on both sides but our constitution contains two different kinds of language and you've been studying with professor barber and he was set you straight on all this sometimes it's very specific the president has to be 35 years old not mature but sometimes it speaks in broad language of no unreasonable searches and seizures no violation of liberty without due process, no infringing on the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, and that, that clause was uh, sort of eviscerated by the court, which is why they relied on the due process clause. It seems that they should they could talk about privileges or immunities and, and, and do it that way, and a, a broad guarantee of equal protection, which should be understood in our tradition as being capable of growth. So it's not radical, it's, uh, it's the, uh, the way of proceeding of Justice Harlan in Palco versus Connecticut that thinks partly analogically, that proceeds slowly, and uh, it seems to me a pro-democratic decision insofar as we understand it as, well, first of all, it's supported by a majority. So if you're a majoritarian of the Americans, uh, 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 in a way, it gets around a, a, a difficulty of changing the law in our society, which is it's very hard to overturn an entrenched law. But in any case, it seems to me the courts play a very important role in our democracy. And they're regarded as widely legitimate by our people. Uh, the Federal Reserve Board plays an important role here. We have lots of institutions that are not directly electorally accountable but they're authorized by a popularly ratified constitution and they're accountable to people in appropriate ways which is through the quality of their arguments. So if people disagree strongly with the same-sex marriage decision, they'll have a chance to vote for representatives who can, who can attempt to have those uh, uh, decisions reversed over the course of time. But I think the courts play a vital and uh, crucial role in our democracy uh, and they're appropriate, they're accountable in the appropriate way for the quality of their arguments uh, made in public. You want to get in on the... Yeah, just of course, judicial review is legitimate when it's actually based upon the text or the history or the structure or the logic of the Constitution. Uh, judicial review, which is just cloaking legislation, uh, legislating from the bench, is inappropriate. And I think the crux of the disagreement between Professor Nacito and myself here is that I don't see any justification in the actual Constitution for five judges saying we prefer Professor Nacito's professor, uh, philosophy of marriage to the conjugal conception. I think where the Constitution doesn't speak to an issue, it's not the role of judges to settle difficult political issues. It's the role of citizens and their elected representatives. It's the representative branches of government that make policy. It's the non-elected. It's the, you, we, the reason that we protect the judiciary from popular opinion is precisely so that it can be faithful to the Constitution. And I don't think the Constitution spoke to this question, and that's why I think it's an illegitimate instance of judicial review. As we mentioned uh, in the the introduction, uh, both uh, Dr. Anderson and Professor Macedo have uh, just written uh, very good books uh, on these subjects we've been talking about tonight. 
Uh, I'm using these books in the class. We're going to be talking about them on Thursday in class. Uh, the uh, bookstore graciously agreed to come, and they have the books for sale. Uh, I'm certain for sure our authors would happily sign them. Uh, I want to also invite, uh, if anyone had a question that uh, they uh, would like answered but we didn't have time for, you know, please come down. Um, probably get right in front of the line if you buy a book. And uh, ask your question. Um, I want to thank both of you gentlemen. I mean, this is a model of uh, engagement and discussion. So thank you very much for coming to Notre Dame. And uh, please join uh, me in thanking Professor Mr. Thank you.